Any questions? Miss any hands? All right. So um, today we're upgrading surfaces, really. Uh, so again, kind of, I, I think a lot of this stems from like 12.5. And when I think about it, I often kind of relating things back to 12.5, where we got our first example of lines and planes, our kind of easiest surface and our easiest space curve. All of chapter 13 was about upgrading lines. And so we talked about how to find arc length, and we talked about how to do derivatives and integrals and all this sort of stuff. We spent a lot of time upgrading curves. Uh, in chapter 14, we're going to be spending a lot of time upgrading our surfaces, right? We did a little upgrade in 12.6 about quadric surfaces, but here in chapter 14, we're gonna be upgrading to kind of full on surfaces, uh, not just even quadratic stuff. And so 14.1 is a lot of the algebra. We get one section dedicated to the algebra of multivariable surfaces, right? And so this is where you see problems like domains and ranges and graphs and things like this, right? So kind of all the stuff that you might've done back in your algebra days, but now we're doing it with f of x, y, rather than just f of x. We also talk about, uh, I guess here's an example of domain. Basically, domain, we have the same issues of domain here in Calculus 3 that you did back in your algebra days. Those big three issues are that you don't like to divide by zero. You don't like to put a negative into a square root or other even root and you don't like to put zero or negatives into logs. So in this case, because we have a square root that kind of restricts down the domain, we spend some time graphing this. In general, graphing arbitrary surfaces is very difficult in three dimensions. Even sophisticated graphing software sometimes struggles. Um, and so one way in order to visualize these things is to make these like, kind of topological maps, right? You may have seen these, um, you know, of mountains and things like this, right? These contour plots is what they're sometimes called, where you kind of specify these different heights. And if I'm down here near the base of the mountain, right, and I want to climb up the mountain, the question is, you know, how much higher is that? How hard of a hike is that gonna be sort of deal? Of course, if we were to take this and sketch it in three dimensions, right? Each one of those circles represents a different height uh, on some kind of three-dimensional picture here. So these are level curves, also known as contour plots. It's all the place where your surface is level, has a constant value, a constant height. Um, all this can be done, again, for three dimensions. That's just what that says. So that was 14.1. We also, our, our goal, uh, and I'm gonna try to do my best, it's, it's difficult to make it through everything, but then we kind of jump into the calculus. So 14.3 is all about the calculus. Um, formally, these things uh, have limit definitions when you start taking derivatives. Because you have two variables, you have to wonder, am I taking a derivative with respect to x or with respect to y? And ultimately, just, just comes down to adjusting your eyes a little bit, right? It's kind of back in our calculus one days, if x and y are related to one another, they're dependent on one another, then you would need to use some sort of implicit differentiation here. And you used to do that back in your calculus one days. But here, x and y are independent from one another. And so the same rules don't apply. And so what you really need to think about is holding y as constant. Sometimes, you know, when I'm kind of just getting started with these things, I recommend, you know, students think of y as a 5 or something like this. And it's just along for the ride. It, you literally think of it as some constant, whatever your favorite one is, I suppose. Right? And so then the derivative of x squared is 2x. And the y is just constant. It's along for the ride. And so this is how we can take partial derivatives with respect to x or with respect to y. There's a bit about notation that we went over here in the pre-class video. Um, and then we find Clairaut's theorem, uh, which tells us that if you swap the order in which you take derivatives, if you do an x derivative first and then a y derivative, um, and then vice versa, if you did a y derivative first and then an x derivative, that for the vast majority of our functions that we'll be dealing with in our class, nice continuous functions and whatnot, that these will be equal. All right, that's all of the pre-class stuff. Like I said, it's a lot, and I have a lot of notes too. Uh, question? Uh, 14.1 and 14.3, right? 
I don't know if you pull up the schedule, I can double check, but. Is this news to a lot of people? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, uh, sorry about, maybe I'm doing the, so let me pull up my notes. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, uh, sorry about that. Um, so, I mean, luckily we're recording. So uh, if you haven't seen the 14.3 the pre-class video, which it sounds like uh, a good number of folks are in that boat, um, I would recommend maybe after class going back and kind of watching that a little bit slower than what I just presented. Uh, and then certainly you can rewatch any of the notes that we, we take for today. Um, as a side, I always, I mean, uh, it's a dream of mine to get it to be after exam days. I'd love to be, you know, able to cancel class, you know, <laughs> on Fridays after exam sort of deal. But the only way that that kind of all fits in and whatnot is if I if we give up our review days before the exams, and I, I don't think that that's a wise choice. So um, sadly, we have to have class, and today's a pretty full one uh, with the fourteen material here. All right. So just to reiterate uh, here for domains and ranges and whatnot, the domain is a set. Oops, for blue here is a set of x, y points. This can be expressed in set notation, which we'll go over here, or via a graph, which is the primary way that we display this, uh, in the x, y plane. After all, it's a set of x, y points. So these are our inputs. Remember, the, the domain is always the set of inputs. Uh, and so those are the things that go into our function f of x, y. Now for uh, our two variable function here, the range, right, is a set of z values. The range is always the outputs for a function. Uh, because it's just real numbers, right, these can be most easily expressed using interval notation. And so that's what we'll primarily be doing. I have a few examples here for us to uh, do domains and then ranges. So again, the, the big three things that you're looking for for domains are the same big three things that you did back in your algebra days. You don't like to divide by zero. You don't like to put a negative into a square root or even root. Uh, and you don't like to put negatives or zero into logs. So in this case, if I'm thinking about what would restrict my domain, what would break any of those kind of big three rules here? Well, I don't see any square roots, and I don't see any logs. And so the only thing that I'm worried about is that there is a bit of division, right? So I, I wouldn't want x minus y to be equal to 0. If that was the case, that would be a problem. Or I don't want y minus x cubed to be equal to 0. If that was the case, right, I'd be dividing by 0, and that would be a problem. So if I simplify these, right, I can solve y equals in both of these. Those are my two kind of problem curves. So now let me go ahead and, as it says, do a sketch. Basically, everywhere in the xy plane, all of those combinations of xy values are fine, except if I lie on the line y equals x, or if I lie on the curve, y equals x cubed. It's kind of cubic curve here. Typically, when we're doing domains, we shade in right everything that's uh, fine. And then everything that you don't want to include, right? you wouldn't shade. Uh, for the, right, so we can go all the way up to these lines, but we really don't want to touch them. Uh, it's a little bit hard to maybe demonstrate that, except for with just dashed lines, right? That's kind of what we typically do 
back in our algebra days, I can add in, I can cheat using technology and I can use a white pencil <laughs> and really emphasize that you go up to these lines, but you don't include them. Remember, if you want to include the line, you just make it solid, right? But if you don't want to include it, it should be dashed. All right, and then it asks to write this in set notation. So set notation looks like this. You say, first of all, what is the overall structure of the set? So in this case, we have uh, ordered pairs, so x's and y's. Um, I would say you can put this or uh, not. Usually, if you, you don't put it, it's it's assumed. But this just means, yeah, so this is in, and this is our x, y plane. And that's the notation for all real numbers. Then you put a straight vertical bar. Uh, this means such that. And then you can put all of your conditions after this. So, so we want sets of x, y pairs here in the real numbers such that y is not equal to x and y is not equal to x cubed. So you can see there wasn't really a whole lot of work for this set notation uh, once we had the graph here. All right, let's try one more, and then I'll open it up to questions uh, about really any of this stuff. So again, I have another function. I'd like to sketch the domain and write it in set notation. So in this case, I see there's kind of two issues. First of all, I have a log. So I want to make sure that whatever I'm plugging into my log is not 0 and it's not negative. Another way to say that is make sure that it's positive, right? So I want to make sure what I plug into my log is positive. Otherwise, I'm not in the reals. The other thing is that I want to make sure that I'm not dividing by 0. So these are the two big things here. All right, so I have to figure out kind of what do these surfaces look like, or these curves look like. Of course, x not equal to 0, that's pretty straightforward. You know, if I was to go ahead and draw my x, y plane, uh, where x is 0, that means I haven't moved to the left any, I haven't moved to the right any. That's equivalent to the y axis here. So it's a little bit hard to see, but I have a dashed long line along x equals 0 or the y axis. The other thing is this here. This is a little bit mysterious, and I, I know kind of my personal first intuition for these things is to try to solve y equals. I know how to graph a lot of things if I have y equals. But this is one thing here that uh, actually we know what this is without solving y equals. And if you try to solve y equals, it actually may be uh, harder. So if I rearrange and I get x squared plus y squared on the same side, which we did this a lot in 12.6, mind you, uh, this should look kind of like, oops, the, I want green, there we go. X squared plus y squared is equal to one, right? I'm kind of thinking in the back of my head, well, this is kind of like a circle. So again, I don't want it to actually be equal. I want it to be greater than a circle of radius one. So if I go ahead over here and maybe draw my circle of radius one, I can go all the way up to this. Now the question is, should I be shading maybe inside of my circle or outside of my circle? Outside, good. So you want your x, y points here to actually have a radius greater than one. Oh, that's my... So again, it's all of these points. We also need to exclude our x axis here. If you're ever hesitant, right, uh, about should it be inside or outside, this one I agree was pretty straightforward, but maybe there's a trickier one later on. A good way to test is by doing a test point. So plug in a specific point. So like I could test maybe inside of my circle. Oops, that's the uh, one of the pencil here. So inside of my circle, for instance, maybe at uh, this point, which I'm going to say is negative 1 half 0. That's certainly inside of my circle here. If I plug this in, does it satisfy my inequality? 
Well, I would have one fourth plus zero minus one should be a positive number, should be greater than zero. Is that true? No. So I don't shade that part. At this point, you could probably be pretty confident that you need to shade the other part, but if you wanted to be extra careful, right, you could choose a point outside of the circle. For instance, maybe this one's negative two zero and plug that in, right? So that's gonna say that four plus zero minus one, that should be greater than zero. Is that true? Yes. So that's the bit that I'm shading. So again, this one was pretty straightforward, but if you had a, a more difficult one, you could choose some test points in order to figure out what to shade. Finally, the set notation here, we want the set of x, y points in our real plane such that x is not equal to zero and x squared plus y squared should be greater than one. You could also write x squared plus y squared minus one is greater than zero, right? Either one of those would be fine. All right, any questions about domains? All right, let's go ahead then. Here's a problem where uh, the big kind of new thing here for this one is that I wanna talk about the range. Ranges I find typically are more difficult than domains. Uh, they're also, the, the problems that you can ask about ranges are a lot fewer, kind of, we can do quite horrible looking functions and ask you about the domains, but ranges in general that uh, it becomes quite difficult problem quite quickly. So you can see for this problem, our function looks a lot nicer. So let's first start off uh, with the domain and maybe I'll give you 60 seconds, 90 seconds or so. Please tell me, right, what is the donate domain? Uh, and sketch it and write it in the set notation. And then we'll work on the range together. All right, I see a lot of good progress being made. What do you think about this for uh, part A? Seem reasonable? Question? So are we allowed, so the question is, how do we, we know if it's simplified enough? And went on to ask, are we allowed to write what y minus x is equal to zero? Uh, oh, so like in this, uh, for the set notation? Yeah, you could write it like that. Um, I, I don't think that that would be bad enough to like get points taken off or anything like this, but uh, kind of if this was a multiple choice style question, right? Uh, hopefully, uh, if this is one of your answers, you will identify that they're equivalent. So notice that this one had the equal sign. So we actually included the line, first one without dashes dashed lines here, so that's kind of nice. Uh, and so yeah, this is the domain, all the set of points here that you can plug in into this function and it will make sense. You'll get a real valued output. Uh, and again, if you're at all hesitant about should you be shading the left half or the right half or whatnot, you can choose test points.
All right, for the range, the range I'd like to try to give you uh, my best attempt of a, a strategy here, but you'll see that these kind of, uh, they're, they're all kind of different enough that uh, my strategy is not very concrete, unfortunately. So my typical strategy for finding range is first off, find range of outside function. And then two, look at inside function. And see if there are additional restrictions. This is as helpful as it can be. Unfortunately, I know that this is maybe as we do a couple examples, this will get better. Uh, but this bonus video, right, is actually talking about ranges and whatnot because they, they are more difficult. And so I invite you to also at the end of uh, today's class, uh, you know, if you have some time, go and watch that bonus video on ranges. So let's try to apply this here. My outermost function is that I'm taking the square root of something. You can do the square root of u if you'd like but the square root of something. Now, square roots, they can't output everything, right? The, the range of a square root is just the positives. Remember, you're not allowed to plug negatives into square roots. And if you, right, when you take a square root, when you apply a square root, you need the plus and the minus to get all the numbers because a positive square root only outputs the positive numbers. So now my question is that, so this is my part one, thinking about the outside function and what is its range. And then, so the second step of this is that I need to think about what we're actually plugging in. So this y minus x. Now for my square root function, if I was to just draw kind of a quick little aside picture here, square roots look like this. And you see that they, put, they output values that are close to zero if you input something close to zero, right? The, the, the origin is included here. So my first question maybe is, can I be clever and come up with a combination of x's and y's that gets me close to the origin here, that gets me close to zero when I plug in for an x and a y? And I hope the answer is yes, right? You could just do x equals one, and, sorry, y equals one and x equals one, right? Because then you have one minus one and that's zero. So that would be a perfectly way, fine way to go about this. You could also have just done zero, zero, or you could do five, five, or anything like this, right? All right, so now I can see that I can input things that are very, very close to zero. If I wanted to get something, right, the, the outputs that eventually go off to infinity, right, because the range of this thing is zero to infinity, the things that eventually go off to infinity, you need to be able to plug in very, very large things, right? So a larger input gives you a larger output. Square root's a, a increasing function. So the question is now, can I plug in very, very large things, right? And well, the x is working against me, but I could always choose to be x equals zero, right? So I could do something like y equals, you know, 100,000 or whatnot, and then x equals zero. And yes, I can plug in very, very large things. And so, from this, I think that there are no additional restrictions, that I can get the full range of the square root all the way from zero off to infinity. So the answer here is indeed zero to infinity. Let me do a quick side problem before we do these level curves and whatnot. I just wanna show you what some additional restrictions might look like, and then I'll, I'll take questions. So if I gave you instead that f is equal to, uh, let's do 1 minus x squared minus y squared inside of a square root. So the first thing I would do is I'd look at my outmost func outermost function. I'd say that the range on that would normally be from 0 to infinity. And then I'd look on the inside, right? And the question is, can I plug in 
like all of these values to get out the zero to infinity. And I claim that there's actually a maximum value that you can get inside of the square root. Can anyone see what it is? Yeah, so you have one and then you subtract away a positive and then you subtract away another positive. So there's no way that I could ever plug in two inside of the square root, for instance. No matter what I chose for x and for y, I'm never getting my one minus x squared minus y squared to be equal to two. So the maximum value that I can actually get in to the square root is one. So that actually means that the, the maximum output that I can get is the square root of one. So this would be an additional restriction. And so in this case, the answer would be from zero to one. Does that make a little bit more sense about how these additional restrictions could act? Okay. Uh, so I saw there was a question here, and then we'll go here. So, yeah? Let's say for the, the first part of the problem. Yes. Let's say y minus x turns out to be like 36. Okay. Uh, won't the root of 36 be both minus 6 and 6? Because you can go minus 6 times minus 6. You can go to 6 times. Uh, yeah. Won't it go to negative infinity as well? I mean, plug it into your calculator, right? The square root of 36, it'll tell you it's just 6. So there's a subtle difference between if I ask you to solve for x squared is equal to, uh, in fact, let me, I'm going to cheat and I'm going to change your number a little bit. Let's say seven, right? So I'm going to say x squared is equal to seven, right? If I ask you to solve this, you're absolutely right that there are two solutions. There's the positive square root of seven and there's the negative square root of seven, right? So these are the two solutions to that. But if I just write down something with a positive square root, kind of a little bit silly to even write that positive sign there. But if I just write down a positive square root like we have here, no one's told anyone to take a square root. I'm just saying, here's a positive square root. Then in that case, the only outputs are positives. Does that make sense? Excellent. Yeah, good question. I, I find that that's a tricky thing from algebra. So I'm, I'm glad that that got brought up. Uh, and then over here, yeah. Sorry, one more time. Uh, for my alternate problem, the question is, why are we including one into the range? Uh, so the range is a set of points that can actually be achieved by the function. So if I plug in x equals 0 and y equals 0, then I get the square root of 1 minus 0 squared minus 0 squared, which is the square root of 1, which is 1. So one can actually be achieved. It's not that you can just go up to it, but you can't actually get to it, but you can actually achieve one. So x equals zero, y equals zero, uh, gives an output of one for that. All right, so let's also do some of these level curves. You'll have a few web work problems kind of related to this as well. So sketch some level curves. Typically for, you know, if this was a quiz or exam sort of problem, they would tell you what specific level curves they want you to sketch. So I'm going to go ahead and choose some different k values. So I'm going to choose k equals 0, k equals 1, and maybe uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit, and I'm going to choose k equals 4. Maybe that one's nicer. Uh, actually, no, this is square root. I'm going to do 2. This is 0, 1, 2. So remember, level curves are the set of heights, right? What would you input to get these set of heights? And so, for instance, if I choose k equals 0 first, I have 0 is equal to my function. And I could sketch this curve. The next one I might choose is k equals 1. And that would give me 1 is equal to the square root of y minus x. And then finally, uh, I have my k equals 2. And that'll give me 2 is equal to the square root of y minus x. If I chose a negative here, right? So I, I just chose 0, 1, 2, because it says sketch some level curves. Again, this is a perfectly fine problem to be doing in class. But if it was a quiz or an exam, right, you'd want to know maybe how many should I choose, right? Should I choose 3? Should I choose 2, right? Um, it's also not clear maybe at this point is like, uh, could I have negative one? 
Well, the problem is our function, the range, we know that it's zero to infinity. There's no way that you could achieve a height of negative one. So in this case, no, you can't choose negative one just because uh, it's not in your range. It's not in your set of outputs. All right, so looking at these functions now that I need to sketch, as they stand, I have no idea what these look like. But again, kind of, we can rearrange these, and typically I like to get a y equals if I'm graphing things, and then I think it becomes a lot easier. So if I square both sides, I get 0 is equal to y minus x, and then I can rearrange and I just get y is equal to x. So my first level curve, where I have, this is every place where we have a height of 0, looks like y equals x. My next level curve, if I was trying to find all the places where we height, have a height of 1, uh, well, if I square both sides, I get 1 is equal to y minus x. And if I solve y equals, I get x plus 1. So it's still a slope 1, but now the intercept has gone up. This is all the places where we have a height of 1. And then lastly here, with k equals 2, if I square both sides, I get 4 is equal to y minus x. So now by rearranging, I get that, again, we have a slope 1 line, but now the intercept's up at 4. So 2, 3, 4. This is all the places where the function takes on a height of 2. Again, the output, the k value here was 2. So this is one of these, again, kind of like uh, topographical maps here. It's also kind of nice to think about this back with the uh, domain intact as well, right? That kind of this edge here is actually all the places where we have height 0. And then you have height 1 a little bit in, and then height 2 farther in sort of deal. If I was trying to do my best to sketch this, right? Again, uh, we have like a y equals x line at height zero. So y equals x at height zero is going to be something like this. So uh, here's the positive x and the positive y. And having a height of zero means that I haven't gone up at all, right? I'm just in the um, x, y plane. Next up, if I wanted to sketch my height one line, well, notice that first of all, it goes through this intercept uh, at y equals one, but also it has a height of one. So it's kind of going through this line here. And so I'll do my best to draw a parallel line here. And then finally, for my last one, it was a height two. It's all the places where the output is two, but the intercept is up at four. So two, three, four. Maybe that point is included. Oops, that's not very parallel. So something like that. If you use some graphing software, you'll see that this looks like a square root function. And what that y minus x is doing, right? It is a square root function. That y minus x is kind of taking it and turning it a bit. So it's kind of going off in an interesting direction here. So this right here is what this surface looks like. Any questions here? Yeah. So yeah, the question is, why does this go into 3D? Why doesn't it just stay into the XY plane like it did in the other graph? Um, so the, the other ones, we were interested in sketching domains, right? And so, and, and we did that as well, right? We sketched the domain here, uh, and we did that a few other times as well. 
but in this problem, right, the, the full question here is to actually sketch some level curves. And with level curves, you can say what the 3D picture looks like. And so in the pre-class notes, for instance, uh, we did this same sort of problem where we first did level curves to get a 2D picture, but then we used our 2D picture to say, okay, well, let's try to visualize what would this really look like in three dimensions. And we made that jump from 2D to 3D. So it really comes down to what's the question being asked. If it just asks for domain, it's all in the XY plane. But it asks to actually sketch the graph, right? Uh, I suggest using level curves and then making that jump to three dimensions. I saw there was another question in the chat here. Oh, okay, good. All right, so then let me give you a, a problem to try out here. Consider this function, find the range. By the way, so I mean, when you go back and you look at my work that I did for range, uh, this is not work that, uh, you know, it's tough to kind of give partial credit for range style problems, right? It's a lot of trying to convince yourself. So, I mean, I, I did do, step one was kind of quite clear, but then step two, I just started jotting down some points and I was trying to convince myself if there were any additional restrictions or not. So more often than not, I find if a problem, you know, it, on a quiz or an exam is asking about range, quite often it's a multiple choice or true false style problem, just because uh, the work behind these things, it's, it's more trying to convince yourself or convince, you know, uh, someone uh, what it is. And it's really hard to write down all the words in order to give a full explanation. So please take 60 seconds, 90 seconds, get as far as you can on this problem here. So this one's a bit more difficult, I think, because it's debatable what the outside function is, right? So I, I think maybe some of you out there could say, well, let's just start off with, oops, two raised to some power sort of deal. And you could spend your time working on that and that would be perfectly fine. But later on, you'd have to add in that three. So really there's gonna be a third step here, which is somehow you have to account for that plus three business, right? Others out there may just want to say, well, this is kind of, I want to take the entire thing here as my outside function, and I'm going to work with this. Uh, if you'd like to do that, right, you can kind of step, skip this third step, uh, but this is a more complicated function. So let me go ahead. Um, I'm going to go do the easier one first, and then I'll show you just how to deal with that plus three. So maybe the first thing, if I'm thinking about two raised to some power, two to the star or two to the youth power. And right, I have to think about what is the range for this? And the last time we saw, we did a little sketch and that kind of helped as well. 
But two raised to some power is an exponential. So it kind of, the exponentials look like this, right? And in particular, if I plugged in zero for u, I would get out one. If I plugged in one for u, I'd get out two, so on and so forth. But exponentials, they look like this. They're never negative. Uh, they have kind of this asymptote, right, at uh, zero. So now, if I wanted to also bring in this plus three, that plus three there is just going to take this and ra raise it up by a factor of three, right? So we're going to go, instead of going through one, we're going to go through, let's see, here's two, three, four. So I'm going to take my graph. I'm going to raise that up. So now it goes through four rather than one. That also means that my asymptote has changed, right? So now my asymptote also gets shifted up. And the range for this is going to be, well, you can get very, very close to three. Can't quite touch it. Um, and you go off to infinity, right? You keep on getting bigger and bigger values. So the range here is going to be from three. Oops. That should be a, oh, my iPad's given up. Jump back to Zoom, Zoom, reshare screen, start broadcast. All right. And we're back. So two to the U has a range of zero to infinity. It only outputs positives. You can get very, very close to zero, but you never quite touch it. And if you want to include the three in there, right, then you raise that up by three. And so the range for this kind of more complete outside function rate is going to be from three to infinity. So that's kind of my first step thinking about this outside function. The next step is that I need to think about x times y. Now I think about, right, can I get, uh, in particular, right, if I want to get very, very close to 3, I need to be able to plug in uh, very, very negative things. And if I want to go off to infinity, I need to be able to plug in very, very positive things. And so now I think about x times y. If I wanted to choose an x and a y value to get something very, very negative, could I do that? Yeah, right? So I could choose x equals negative a million, and I could choose y equals 1, right? And if I wanted to choose something very, very positive to input in here, right, I could choose x equals positive a million and y equals 1. Or I could choose both of them to be positive a million, right? And I can choose, I can really get everything in between. If I wanted 0, I could choose x equals 0 and y equals 53. I don't care, right? There, so there's no number that I really can't achieve um, with x times y. So no additional restrictions. And so the answer here is going to be oops, anything from 3 off to infinity. Questions on this one? Oh, sorry, yes. Is this range off in the y direction? So, uh, so it's the um, range is a set of z values in our class. It's a set of outputs. So I guess technically, right, I haven't given you the um, axes here. This would have to be the u axes, and this would have to be the z axes. Yeah. Super. All right, another type of problem that I wanted to show you that can sometimes show up on quizzes and exams and whatnot is that, again, I, I've already told you we don't like to you know, grade people's sketches of things. So at very least, we could ask you to classify what the, would your sketch look like, right? So which of the following best described level curves of this function? Are they lines? Are they ellipses? Are they hyperbolas? Exponential curves? Logarithmic curves? What shape are these level curves? And so in the interest of time, let's do this one together. I'm going to go ahead and choose a few k values just to try to get the ball rolling here. Remember, these level curves, these are a set of outputs of the function. 
right? So these I'm plugging in for my z or my f of x, y. So I could do zero is equal to e to the x plus y. I could do one is equal to e to the x plus y. I could do two is equal to e to the x plus y. Now, again, I have no idea what these look like as they stand. I'm a lot more comfortable if I have a y equals for graphing and trying to identify what the curve is. So if I was trying to solve y equals for all of these, I'd probably go down the line and I'd take the natural log. Your calculator is going to yell at you pretty bad in this case. Remember, logs don't like zeros and they don't like negatives. But I didn't know that, right? Because I haven't really explored what is the range of this. So sometimes you may choose a k value that gives you a nonsensical output. And you just need to know to exclude that and keep on going. So, okay, this one didn't work out. The natural log of zero, it's going to yell at you in your calculator and say that that's not defined. However, the natural log of one, if you plug that into your calculator, it'll tell you that it's zero. And so I can solve this, that this is y is equal to negative x. So right now, I'm leaning pretty hard towards lines. right? That's certainly not an equation of ellipse or a hyperbola. It's not even exponential or logarithmic. y equals negative x is a line. Well, let's be paranoid and check one more, right? Natural log of two. If you plug natural log of two into your calculator, anyone have a calculator that can tell me what that is? I think it's around like 0.7, but could be off. Ah, it is close to 0 0.7. 0 0.69314, thank you, Omar. Uh, I'll just put 693. So again, we can see, I mean, you can leave this as the natural log of two. But the natural log of two is a constant. In particular, it's 0.693 and change, right? And so again, this is a line, but it's just been shifted a little bit. And so we can see now that indeed, these level curves are going to be lines. No drawing required, still testing your knowledge about level curves. All right, it is 11.10. Um, this stuff here, I probably will make a video on this 14.3 stuff that we couldn't quite get to. Um, luckily, the rest of chapter 14 will be doing a lot of derivative stuff, and so we'll get plenty of practice with this, so I don't feel so bad on how we spent our 50 minutes together. Uh, but still, I'll make a video of these things and post it on D2L. Hopefully by 3 o'clock today, the video will take me a little bit longer um, and you can watch that over the weekend or whatnot and come prepared for 14.4 uh, in Monday's class. So, all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. I'll stick around if there are any one-on-one -on -one questions.